I'm Lauren Nellis. I'm the founder and executive director of Food Empowerment Project. We are a vegan food justice organization. Um, we primarily work on promoting veganism in various ways, and I'm going to kind of weave in some of the work that we do in this talk. Um, I've been vegan um, since the late 80s in Texas. Uh, <laughs> this is my 28, I'm almost over 28 years of being vegan, and um, yeah, I went vegan when I was in high school, which um, was fun with my family to try and get them to understand. I'm also Chicana, very proud Chicana, um, and uh, so that also made it even more fun. But um, I've been involved in the animal rights movement um, since I was 17. And I really decided that I wanted to dedicate my life to fighting for the rights of non-human animals. Um, during this time, though, the, what was happening in um, South Africa with apartheid was still going on. So I also was involved in that, and I was also involved in the boycott of grapes um, that the United Farm Workers had asked. So I kind of learned at an early age the power of our food choices. And I realized that I wanted to, to, to do more. And being a rebellious youth, I kind of really went 100% headstrong into being an animal rights activist, um, which I am today, still. Um, but after doing this work for a while, I decided that I wanted to figure out a ways to make the connections, to show people that all of these issues are connected, and that we have a responsibility to fight for all that are vulnerable and all that are oppressed. So I want to thank the organizers of this conference, um, Crystal and Keegan and everybody, for all that they've done to make this happen. And as well, I probably will say it again because I'll forget by the end of my talk, which is an hour and a half, I think. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> that they made sure that all the chocolate at this event is chocolate that we recommend, meaning that it's not sourced from the worst forms of child labor, including slavery. And I really want to thank them for being vegans who get this wider circle of compassion that we need to have as well. So the title of my talk, we figure out, okay, is what is sustainable? And the reason why the, I created this whole concept, I actually wrote a blog on it because I was invited to a meeting. I, Food Empowerment Project's office is in a hub with a lot of startup, bless you, Ari, um, with a lot of startup organizations and um, a lot of environmental startups. And they invited me to a meeting and they wanted to talk about the sustainability conference that they were going to have. And I realized that my impression of sustainability was much different than theirs. And I realized that what is the definition of sustainable? What does it really mean? And I felt like because I had that question, I wanted to answer that myself. So I think for many of us, we think the sustainable is are we using paper napkins or are we using reusable napkins? We see this as an environmental choice. Do we use plastic? Do we use paper? Or do we support Food Empowerment Project with our bags, which we've sold out of? So that is not going to work to sell our <laughs> bags. Sorry about that. But they were made out of 100% recycled water bottles. So again, water bottles or bringing our own. That is a lot of what people think of when they think they say they're being sustainable. Oh, I'm bringing my own utensils, I'm not using plastic. The Sustainable Forestry Initiative thinks that because they're, you know, they're growing more trees, they're being more sustainable because they have an idea of how many can be cut down. Other companies say these are the 10 sustainable um, businesses, or the businesses, some of the businesses that exist. And I look at this list and I think Organic Valley? How can Organic Valley be sustainable if they have milk products, how is that sustainable? Um, how sustainable is L'Oreal when they're testing on animals? So my vision and what I understand is sustainable is in stark contrast to all of this. So Food Empowerment Project, the word sustainability is even in our mission statement. We seek to create a more sustainable world. <coughs> So the word sustainable means a lot to me, and if anybody is really cool, you can count how many times I'm going to use it in this talk, which is going to be a lot. Amy's, if anybody hasn't been to Amy's drive through they have a whole thing on their wall. This is something that corporations are starting to promote and talk about themselves as we are sustainable. Bon Appetit. They, um, they're a management company. They basically like do foods, services to different industries, maybe a museum or schools, things like that. So they have their own definition of what they believe is sustainable and how they define it. If you notice in here, they talk about things like respect for animals. Again, I have a different perception of what sustainable means. They also have seeking out sustainable seafood. 
which I'm sure to many of them, and what this all means is maybe they're not catching as many fish. But what they're not recognizing about what is sustainable is whose life is at stake. Is it sustainable for that fish to be killed? Because someone's saying it's sustainable. That fish's life is on the line. It's not sustainable for his or her life to be taken away. That's not sustainable. We disregard sea creatures so much that we don't even recognize them as individuals. The way that they're counted, so to speak, is in tonnage. The industry doesn't even recognize these beautiful, intelligent, magical creatures as individual beings. They don't even count that much. So then we talk about what else is humanely raised animal products. Again, what is sustainable here? They talk about their milk coming from cows. Um, they're not treated with GBH. So again, they have this impression on what they think sustainable is. Is it cage-free eggs? Well, for many of us, we know that regardless of how the hens are kept, if they're gonna be on pastures, if they're gonna be having a, in a shed, all of these chickens are gonna die a horrible fate. They're all gonna be trucked to the same type of slaughterhouses. All the male chicks are gonna be disregarded. They're gonna be either ma thrown in maceration machines where they're chopped up alive or they're suffocated. We tried to pass a law in California to ban the suffocation and the burning alive of animals who were raised for food and we couldn't get the bill out of committee because the poultry industry said in a, in a small meeting with the author of the bill that if they wanted to burn animals alive, they could if they wanted to. So how is any of this sustainable? How, how can this definition change? I mean, the way I look at it is language is constantly evolving and we need to take back what this word sustainable truly means. It's not a matter of just the environment, it's a matter of lives that are on the line. Joy is who I like, she's my, my new representative for veganism. I always talk about why veganism is such a strong part of what Food Empowerment Project does. And unfortunately, rabbits are more than not now turned to as this sustainable animal because maybe they take less land or they eat less. And so rabbits are now seen as the turn is sustainable. So a lot of these small farms, these little niche markets are having them, even farmers markets are having them. And what I say everybody, I've met Joy. Joy actually came from a, a meat, uh, quote unquote, meat farm. And I met her pretty quickly after she was rescued. And she was so scared, she cowered behind the toilet seat. She wouldn't come near anybody. After a few weeks of being with her guardians, one of which who took this picture, she was so eager to come and meet everybody and befriend everybody that she could. Again, we could do a whole talk on animals and forgiveness. Um, but this specifically is that Joy has a right to her own body. Joy has a right to her body. She has a right to her fur. She has a right to everything about this cute little bunny that she wants. If she wants to jump in the air and do binkies, if she wants to eat grass, if she wants to feel the sun on her body. Sustainability is not a part of this. There is no way that anything that's not vegan or harms human or non-human animals can be seen as sustainable. Again, when we talk about sustainability, this is Autumn. She lives at a sanctuary called Vine in Vermont. And she had her baby taken away from her. Again, the babies are taken away from their moms in the dairy industry, sometimes immediately after birth, because those moms are going to fight to be with their babies. So it's better for these industries to separate them really quickly when the moms are still out of it after giving birth. This is little Maddox. I'm gonna see how the sound's gonna work. This is little Maddox. Um, he's also at Vine. And I'm just gonna play, so I've done a lot of investigations at factory farms and slaughterhouses throughout the United States. And what I'm gonna play for you is um, sounds of a mom and a baby um, bellowing back and forth um, to each other in a small farm I investigated in Georgia. So how is it sustainable for that mom and that baby to be separated? It's simply not. It's simply not for either one of them, for that baby to never know what it's like to nestle with her mom. It's not sustainable. 
no matter how flashy these brochures are or how much text they put on their websites, none of this is sustainable, not to the animals whose lives are on the line. But we also look at who are the workers who are working in these slaughterhouses. The vast majority of them are undocumented people who are coming from other countries who are also vulnerable. They experience incredible health ailments. Um, sexual abuse is rampant in these locations. Um, my organization, we do protest in front of a chicken slaughterhouse every month in Petaluma. And these are, if you've ever heard of Rosie and Rocky the rooster or Rocky the chicken, I always call it a rooster and I know it's a chicken. But anyway, that is quote unquote from sustainable farms. But we go out and we bear witness to these animals who are being slaughtered. Um, this small slaughterhouse kills 50,000 chickens a day. Mind you, they're using municipal water from Petaluma's city water supply. California's in a drought, and yet we let these slaughterhouses use municipal water, and how sustainable is that? This is a town that has banners telling everybody to conserve water, and yet they allow this slaughterhouse to expand. Again, who's that sustainable for? Yeah, you say right every time I say what's sustainable. <laughs> so we, we also look at these communities. Um, we also look at these communities who are impacted, right? North Carolina, where the vast majority of pig farms are. You have communities who are living next to these pig farms who suffer from headaches, nausea, nosebleeds, can't have their windows open in the summertime because the flies are so bad. These communities, it's called environmental racism when certain portions of communities of color are more impacted by negative pollutants than anybody else. We had the same thing, this is a farm here in California with over 17,000 cows. In California, we have um, environmental racism taking place. Majority of the people living in these communities are Latino communities who are impacted by um, negative pollutants. We have some of the highest rates of asthma in these areas because of what these farms are doing to our communities. Again, for milk, one dairy cow produces 120 pounds of wet manure per day. So imagine a farm that has 17,000 cows. I, w I helped stop a dairy cow in Solano County in a town called Dixon, not far from here, where they had, were trying to build a 16,000 cow farm and a 1,500 cow heifer farm, which means the baby little cows before they've given birth. And the Planning Commission accepted a negative declaration from the farms on the impact of the environment. No impact on the environment? The mayor was very happy when I attended one of their uh, meetings to let them know because she had no idea what was happening. <laughs> So again, you know, kudos to Bon Appetit. They acknowledge farm worker rights. They acknowledge what's happening in the fields. Um, again, Food Empowerment Project is a vegan organization, but we also say to ourselves, how cruelty-free is our diet? How compassionate is our diet if there are farm workers suffering in the fields? If you didn't know, the average lifespan of a farm worker is 49 years old. 49 years old. That is the extent of their lives. Um, this is a picture from the Coalition of Immokalee Workers that actually has a campaign right now against Wendy's. And they're campaigning against Wendy's because P Wendy's will not pay the farm workers one more penny per pound for the tomatoes that they pick. One penny more. So I ask you, if you're excited about the Wendy's veggie burger, that you boycott that burger. You do not eat that burger, and you write Wendy's and you tell them why. Let them know you're compassionate, you're a vegan, but you want to make sure that they also respect the rights of farm workers as well. Because why? It's not sustainable, right? It's not sustainable for these farm workers to be living like this, to be living, working, you know, 14 hours a day. We just helped pass a law in California to make sure that farm workers get paid overtime. Farm workers in the state of California were not getting paid overtime, like every other worker does in the state. We're also working on, um, farm workers in California are also forced to move. Um, when they are living in migrant labor camps in the state of California, when the picking season is over, they're forced to move 50 miles away from that labor camp, pulling their children out of schools. So these are actual information from farm workers um, who were asked if they believe that, that this affects their children to have to pull them out of school. As you can see, the vast majority of people who answered said yes. 
You also, they were also asked, do you think that your child would benefit from being able to finish school in the entire school year? Over 96% of them said yes. What we've been doing is we've been asking the department in California that's in charge of this to make some type of consideration for the families who want their children to be able to finish their education. And they have refused. We're going to be having a protest in Sacramento at their office on December 9th to let them know that we do care about how farm workers are treated and that it's not sustainable for these children not to be able to complete their education. We're going to be having a young woman who actually lived in the labor camp and is one of the few that we know that has actually been able to go to college. We just did a school supply drive for the children of farm workers. Um, and every, anybody who's in here who donated to that, thank you so much. We were able to collect over 371 backpacks and thousands and thousands of school supplies. If you want an idea how many, we collected 6,000 pencils. And we filled these school supplies for the children of farm workers, which we delivered. And we were able to tell them that we are vegans and we appreciate all the work that they do and that we're just, we, this isn't an act of charity. We're trying to right an injustice that's taking place. can never choose between the girls and the boys, so you get to see both. Um, and I should be updating it soon because we had such cute kids this year, too. But again, I mean, we have to think about this. You know, a lot of people, when we talk about these issues, there are other advocates who, when we say things like we have the most compassionate diet, if they know differently, if they know the people who are suffering in the fields, or they know something about what's happening to farm workers, they know that isn't necessarily true. So we have to make sure that in our activism, we're the most informed that we possibly can be and acknowledge this. But it doesn't take away the good work and the valid stuff that we're talking about for non-human animals. It never takes that away to acknowledge those other abuses in the food industry. One of the other things when we talk about sustainability is what happens when people can't access healthy foods. And this is something that happens locally and it happens globally. It's predominantly people of color and indigenous people who are the most impacted by the inability to access healthy foods. Which means what? Which means that if this is what they are able to get in the store nearest to them, this is a picture from Vallejo, which is not very far from here, which is where we're currently doing our work on the lack of access to healthy foods. If you're doing work in communities and this is what, this is what they can, and I know it's blurry because I wasn't supposed to be taking a picture. Um, but if they only can access potatoes and onions and bananas, it's going to be very difficult for them to be able to go vegan, isn't it? So we need to be aware of this in our activism. And it doesn't mean that there's then nothing we can do. There are things that we can do. Food Empowerment Project, we did a report on the lack of access to healthy foods in Santa Clara County, where we found that there were 14 times more access to frozen vegetables in the higher income areas than they were in the low income areas. We followed up and we did focus groups in these communities. Again, all impacted communities. We did these focus groups. Um, OK, good. Um, and it was interesting because, again, most impacted communities in San Jose, right? In two of the focus groups, people had children who were vegan. And they didn't know how to cook for them. They didn't know what to do. So they were so happy to talk to us. And we could give them information. Because veganism was something they learned on the internet. But the parents didn't quite know how to do it. So we also found out that a lot of the people um, were let me see if I can find it, knew about organics, knew about the fact that they didn't want to consume products that were covered in, in pesticides, but didn't actually have access to it. We found that the biggest barrier for the majority of people in terms of accessing healthy food was the cost of the food. Location was the one thing. We're talking about people who are what, what's called cash poor and time poor. It means they're working multiple jobs. So they don't have the ability to go home and cook all the time. A lot of the grocery stores in these areas close at, say, 9 o'clock. So what's, what's open when they get home are the liquor stores and the fast food restaurants. We're talking about people who travel, take buses and buses just to be able to buy, buy fresh produce. Just to be able to buy it. We also found we're working with a group in St. Louis who told us that the only way they could get fresh produce was to take the bus. They had to take two buses to get it. But... The buses would only allow two bags of groceries on the bus, which didn't allow them to be able to buy a lot for their family. 
We also found that a lot of people who were living in these communities were actually immigrants. And they actually ate healthier in their home countries than they did here. Because they were used to growing their own foods and they were not really wanting to use things like tomato sauce when they wanted fresh tomatoes. We also learned that a lot of people were very familiar with, uh, who were also um, what Food Empowerment Project is calling lactose normal, which means that they can't digest the milk of another species into adulthood. <laughs> ah, yeah, it's working. Um, we're currently doing our work in Vallejo, again, which is not that far from here. And so you, just so you give an idea, I mean, we're in the Bay Area, very wealthy area. Um, for the most part. Um, but it's not very far away. And here we found that 88% of the liquor stores and 71% of all the convenience stores were in communities of color and low-income communities. So when you're thinking people can go to the grocery store, it's kind of like this thing is you have to realize not everybody has that. The vast majority where people are getting their food from is from these liquor stores. There's a liquor store for every 2,769 residents in these communities. I just spent last Friday helping to clean up a 7-Eleven in Vallejo. And I can show you my before and after pictures because I did really hard work to get it very clean. And we just did a ribbon cutting yesterday of that 7-Eleven, which is going to have more produce, which is going to have more vegan foods. Now, the entire event was actually vegan. We worked on it with the county of Solano. Um, we didn't organize it. We're going to be doing work in Vallejo focus groups. but. There's great demand there. We had a huge event there in um, June. And the woman who cooked all the food for us um, had never even heard of like mock meats or fake meats. Never heard of it. So we had to explain to her they were called vegan meats. Because she'd never heard of them before. But she cooked from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, vegan food the entire day coming out of the kitchen from all sort representing the complete diversity of Vallejo, which is one of the most diverse communities in the state. To go on about what, how the situation is there, so again, this is how hard it is for people to access meat and dairy alternatives in this town. Only 17% had a dairy alternative. Only 16 stores even had a meat alternative for the entire city. The entire city. This is not, you know, when we talk about this stuff, it's not how it is for every community. It's not sustainable, right? For us, it's a matter of justice. It's a matter of the fact that everybody has the right to access healthy foods. It should be a right in this country. Instead, it's become a privilege when only certain people with certain means can afford access to healthy foods. We also um, are going to be starting a campaign in October against Safeway. We found out that Safeway, when they moved from the downtown area in Vallejo and they moved to the suburban area, they put a restrictive deed on their former property preventing any grocery store from moving into that area for 15 years. 15 years. This also happened in Washington, D.C., where they were able to pass an ordinance to prevent Safeway from doing this again in their community. We're going to be starting a campaign against Safeway called Shame on Safeway in October, and we really hope that you all get involved. If we want to encourage people to be vegan and we want to help people to be vegan, we have to make sure the access to these foods are available, right? We have to. That has to be the first step. You know, I want everybody to be able to go vegan because I want, want less harm to the animals. But I also want everybody to be able to access fresh fruits and fresh vegetables because that's what's better for them. A majority of people of color, like myself, are lactose normal. So when you deny us these alternatives, you're actually impeding our health. Some people call it food oppression or food apartheid, whatever it is. Not having these alternatives available in our community makes us sick. So one of the, I mentioned it earlier in terms of the chocolate. I'm just, oh, yeah. Okay, I was taking the grocery outlet open, which is good. They have vegan options there. Okay, chocolate, which again, we're very glad that this event paid attention to. Um, so one of the things that we work on, which is, is not sustainable currently, what's going on, is that 70% of the world's chocolate comes from Western Africa. And in these areas, you still have slavery and child labor taking place. You have children as young as seven years old using machetes to cut cacao pods out of the trees. They have scars on their arms and their legs. Children are locked in at night. If they try to escape, they're beaten. This is happening right now as I'm standing here in Western Africa. 
It's an injustice. It's something that I think that always is hard for my heart and my head to wrap around. It's like when I learned about, you know, I went vegetarian when I was in elementary school because because my parents were getting a divorce and growing up in Texas, I could see the cows everywhere. And I realized that if I was to consume that cow, I would be separating a family. I didn't want to be responsible for that. And I figured I could just do my part. But we didn't have a lot of money. And so I was forced to go back to consuming animals. But when I think about the chocolate, and I learned about what was happening in factory farms when I got older, but this is another one of those issues for me, that when I realized what was happening in West Africa, I knew that I had to do something. That it wasn't just about, oh, that's really horrible and it makes me sad and it hurts my heart. I needed to do more, just like I did for non-human animals. So what Food Empowerment Project does is we have a list of chocolates we do and don't recommend based on where they source their chocolate from. So it's, the entire list is on our website. We have a free app that people can download. Um, because we strongly believe in people eating their ethics. And that we have a responsibility with all of our food choices to be as informed as possible, but to also make sure that we are eating our own ethics. When we put something in our mouths, we're thinking about where it comes from and who is responsible for it, and is it sustainable? But we also have a very big responsibility as well is to speak out against the abuses that are taking place, right? If you're an activist for the animals, you do your activism in a variety of ways. Maybe you have a potluck, maybe you write letters to the editor, maybe you talk to family and friends, maybe you protest, whatever it is, right? We don't wanna always just keep this within our own personal choices because in order to change the system, we have to use our collective voices and we have to use everything that's going on to amplify what's happening to animals. It's the same thing for this issue as well. We want people to contact corporations. If you look at our list and we don't recommend the company or the company hasn't disclosed, we had a campaign against Cliff Bar for three years for not disclosing country of origin for their chocolate. They only disclosed when we were days away from delivering 63,000 signatures of a petition at their doorsteps. They, we still don't recommend them. They still source from the worst forms of child labor, including slavery, take place. But this is what we have to do, right? I mean, food is a response. I look at food as a responsibility. I'm privileged enough. I may not have come from a background where we had a lot of money. My mom had a car, though. She raised me and my sisters by herself, but we had a car. We are above a lot of the pay situation for many people in the communities that we work in, definitely the farm worker communities. So those of us who have this privilege, we have to use this as a responsibility, as a tool to think about it and to think about everything that we purchase, just like you would, right, do research on a car. You do research on a computer. You see who has the cheapest prices. But you need to think about what's sustainable and for whom. When it comes to a lot of these issues, Food Empowerment Projects encourages everybody to working on living wage campaigns. Because one of the barriers for many people, like I said, in accessing healthy foods is the cost. So if we try to encourage everybody's raises to go up and everybody can make a living wage, then more people are gonna be able to eat healthier and thus more people are gonna be able to go vegan. Because what, we have all of us advocates out there talking about it. So I kind of created my own term for sustainability. And I think that we, that's something that's always gonna grow and it's always gonna change and we have to help focus that. So when somebody says this is sustainable, then what does that mean? What are you saying when you say it's sustainable? Whose life was taken? Whose life was impacted? And do you agree with what happened with that or not? So when you think about it, and you think about the mother pig and a farrowing crate who just had her piglets, and she can't turn around and she can't take a free step, you ask yourself, is that sustainable? When you think about that mother cow who had her baby taken away from her, who she's never gonna be able to be near again, is that sustainable? When you think about farm workers who are picking our foods, who are dying in the fields because of heat exhaustion, is that sustainable? I argue that what is sustainable is what's gonna continue us in a wider path of compassion and justice. And that's making sure that we define it, and we define it in a way that stands for justice for all. Thanks.